So today what we're going to be talking about is um, the topic function behavior. It goes with these exercises in module five. Remember, I've, I've, because of me having to be out, we're not doing rate of change. So if you are going to do um, business calculus next semester, you might want to take a look. It's not that hard. It just has to do with slope. Okay. All right. So we're just working on this topic today. Yeah, it's nice to just have one for a change. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by getting you guys to understand what it is we're doing. So after we get to past the understanding part and we get into the actual mechanics of what you're working with on this, don't forget to go back in your notes and go, okay, this is all this is talking about. It's not that difficult of a concept. I know you guys are going to understand what I'm talking about as we go through this first example. So the first couple pages don't have, they're not the mechanics exactly of what you're going to do. It's just that understanding. So what you're looking at here is a graph that's showing a driver's speed on the way to work. Okay, so here's time. So for example, you can look at my graph and see how long it took the person to get to work, right? How long did it take? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. And the speed is on the vertical axis. And so you can see the acceleration, the constant speed, the deceleration, and so on, all right? So we're going to answer a few questions that have to do with this, and then we're going to connect it to what you're going to do algebraically with graphs. Okay, so when was, let me see if I've got another page here, wait a minute. Yeah, we'll just write up here. Okay. So tell me when the driver was speeding up, for what times? We're going to just write this in terms of an inequality. We will be moving into using interval notation in a few minutes. But for now, because we're just talking about something familiar, time and speed of a car, we're just going to use inequalities. So tell me between what times this driver was speeding up, from when to when. Start at the beginning, which would be back here. Zero to four. Does everybody see that? That they're speeding up from zero to four, so in between those times. And when else? Eight and a half to okay, now let's look at the tick marks, right? That's two, four, six, eight. You see that? So that's a ten right there. So from ten to when? When do they stop speeding up? That one's halfway in between something. Yeah, that'd be 13, right. Everybody see that? And that's it, right? That's the only time they were speeding up? All right, so the second question, when were they slowing down? So between what times? Six to seven? Uh, yes, because that's halfway between. Everybody agree with that? Yeah. See that? From six to seven minutes, they were slowing down. And then, is this the only other place? 18 to 20. Okay, so 18 to 20. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Is this making sense? Is this making sense? Okay, so everybody understands what we're asking and why people are answering the way they are. All right, and then when, when were they moving at a constant speed? Okay, from four to five, uh, four to six, I think, right? Because that one's at the grid mark. Yeah, so from four to six. And from seven to 10. Okay, I'm gonna have to put it down here. And then one more time, right? That's halfway between, okay, so from 13 to 18, good, okay. All right, now one thing I do want you to notice is that as you're moving from the left to the right, they're always doing something, okay? They're either speeding up, going at a constant speed, or slowing down. 
That's going to be an important thing to notice when we get to the graphs and you're explaining where things are happening. Okay? All right. So another question. Can you tell when this, uh, the driver <laughs> slowed down for a school zone? Okay, they're saying 7 to 10. Does everybody agree with that? Yes. Okay, why is it that you can tell that? <laughs> All right. Yes, that's when I put my uh, cruise control on. <laughs> Make sure that I don't go above 20. Okay. Now, what do you think about that question? Does this represent a function? Yes, because it passes the vertical line test. Everybody sees that? All right, so it is a function. Now, we're going to ask a different question. Speeding up would be the same thing as increasing, right? That's the way you're going to see your questions. They're going to say, where is this function increasing? So in your example that you understood, that's where it's speeding. The, you saw that the car was speeding up. So we're going to say from 0 to 4, we're going to use interval notation, union, what was the other? 10 to 13. Now, somebody might be wondering already, why is she using parentheses instead of brackets? We'll come back to that question in just a minute, all right? But when you're asked the increasing, decreasing, constant questions about a function, never use brackets. You might use brackets with domain and range, but never with increasing, decreasing, constant. And we'll talk about why in just a minute. Okay, so where is it decreasing? That, that corresponds to slowing down, right? Yeah. The function is going down. It's decreasing. So that's from... 6 to 7, there's a parenthesis there, and then what's the next time? Okay, and when was it constant? Let's start at the beginning. You always start from the left and move across, so from 4 to 5, 6, right? 4 to 6, and this, there, let's don't forget this one, 7, that one is halfway between. So that's 7 to 10 and 13 to 18. Okay. Now notice we covered every single interval, right? Let's look at it. 0 to 4, 4 to 6, 6 to 7, 7 to 10, 10 to 13, 13 to 18, and 18 to 20. So we've covered the whole graph by answering those three questions. And those are the only three things that can happen. Your function's either increasing, decreasing, or constant on certain intervals. All right? Oh, and I wanted to talk about why we don't use a bracket. Okay. So let's just think about one particular point. Let's think about this point right here, that point in time, right at four minutes. Before four minutes, it was going up. Right after four minutes, it was staying constant. So the, when do we use a bracket? Well, what, is, what, did, what word did you say? When you're including that value, right? So would you say that this driver was speeding up at exactly at four minutes or going constant? Well, one thing's happening right before that instance. Something different is happening right after it. So what would you include it in? See? So that's why, because you can't, you can't say both things are happening. Right? So you just kind of say neither thing is happening right at that instant. You have a change in the behavior right at four. So that's why you don't use a bracket, because a bracket means include. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so that's a general rule that you can count on for the increasing, decreasing, constant questions, no brackets, all parentheses. Change in behavior. behavior, yes, from increasing to being constant in that case. Okay? All right. So we're going to look at a fresh one now, fresh function. And would you agree that it is a function, first of all? Yes. 
Okay, passes the vertical line test, right? So we're going to say yes on that. Okay, now you guys go ahead and jot down where is it increasing. I want everybody to do it for themselves. And by the way, this is one where it's implied that it continues on the ends. I can't quite reach that one up there, but it's a continuation on the end. Okay, so come in from, you might want to, in fact, let me let you go ahead and answer all three questions at once. Come in from the left and put your intervals as you go. You know, come in from negative infinity and talk about what's happening until a certain place. What's it doing first? Maybe we need to get started. It's coming down. Does everybody see that? Okay, so that should go in the decreasing category. So let's start with that interval. You would say from negative infinity until you get to that x value, negative 1. So to, just to get you started out. Now you guys keep going. So describe, you know, put them in the right categories, put the intervals. I'll agree with that. That's what's happening. First it's decreasing, then it's constant, then it's increasing, then it's decreasing. Does everybody agree with that? Okay, so that's looking up down. That's looking at y. And so what you're answering here, remember, is the x values that are causing this behavior. So if I go from left to right, then my next interval would have been from negative 1 to 3, and that was a constant. And then after that, it's increasing for a little bit. That's from x value 3 to 5. Good. So that goes in here. And then it's decreasing, so we're going to put a union. 5 to infinity. Good. How many people got that right? Okay. All right. Most everybody. Okay. Does anybody have a question then? If you didn't get it. Yeah. Jensen? Actually, no, that sure? Okay. Anybody think of anything? Okay. New concept. All right, a minute ago I said that something changes at the points where you end your intervals. The behavior changes. And so what I want you to do is see that as we're coming in from the left, this function is first decreasing. I'm just going to put a D for decreasing. And then from here to here, it's increasing. Let's just put an I for increasing. And then it's decreasing afterwards. All right? So far, so good. When you have a place like that where your function is decreasing and then increasing, the Y value is called a relative minimum. It's kind of the bottom of a valley. You could see it that way. But it's always where there's a change in the behavior of the function. It came down and then it was going up. And so it's actually not the x value that you say is the relative uh, minimum. It's the y value. Because what we mean is y is at a minimum in an area around it. Okay? It's at a smallest value at least around here. Okay? What's that? Yes. Relative minimums, there can be multiple. There is a term, I'm just going to write it down for you all because the business calc people are going to do this next semester right away. And this is really addressing what you just asked me. Um, an absolute, say, minimum just like the word implies, it is the smallest value on the entire graph. Not every graph has one of those. And of course, if I say absolute maximum, same thing. It's the absolute highest. Uh, I could show you with a parabola. That would be both a relative minimum, 
whatever that Y would be, as well as an absolute, because it is the absolute lowest Y value on the graph. There, isn't, there is none lower on the whole graph. You're not responsible for that yet, but it, I think it helps to, to understand that there is such a thing. Now, okay. in this graph, the absolute minimum would be measured in infinity? And we don't say that. We would say there is none, because if you would say it's negative infinity, that's not a number. There is no lowest. Yeah. Okay, so let's fill this in here. A relative maximum is a Y. Let me see how I wrote this in the notes. This is. This is LMM. I know the positive. It's in module five. Yeah. Yes, we skipped five, and I just went ahead and did the piecewise functions lecture. It's like 15 minutes long. Yeah, that's the. That's in six. That's in module six. A and L. Is M and N. Okay, sorry, I went out of order. It just worked a little bit better with me having to be out. Okay, so I just want to write it the same way I have in the notes. Okay, so a relative maximum is a y or function value. Remember, y is the function at a certain point or points, which is the highest y value nearby. Let's identify the one here. It would be right, it'd be, I'm putting a little horizontal line there to indicate I'm talking about that Y value right there. So the opposite is true for a relative maximum that I said for minimum. It would be as you're coming in from the left, the function is increasing, and then as you pass it, the function is decreasing. So it has to be like visibly on the graph. It can't be infinity. No, it cannot be infinity, right. Um, actually, this would still be, you can have a lot of different, like, just, okay, there's a lot, a lot of highs and lows there. So there'd be a lot of relative maximums and minimums. Every single Y where I hit a top like that, where it was going up and then down, and every place where it was going down and then started going up, every single Y there is a relative extrema is the broader term, which means both. But this is relative max, relative max, relative max. This would be relative min, relative min. And then okay. the absolute max would be the highest. That's right. So the particular example I gave, that does have an absolute max, but it doesn't have an absolute min because it keeps going towards negative infinity. These are good questions that you guys are asking because it, it uh, deepens your understanding when you ask these questions. Okay, so let's write this one down. A relative minimum is a y, func a y or function value at a certain point, which is the smallest y value nearby. But again, that would be where the function was decreasing and now it's increasing. That's where you're going to get that relative minimum. Okay. So this one was a relative maximum. With this point, we had a relative minimum. And that may be on the next page. Let's see. Yes. Uh, oh, this is a different one. Okay. This one's kind of weird. <laughs> I think that this one, um, we threw this one into the notes because um, there are other situations. So this is just showing you that even if it flattens out like that, this is still going to be a relative minimum. So we have a relative minimum of negative 2. It happens on an interval, though. And we have a relative maximum of 2. Now, that one just happens at a particular point, though. It happens at 
x equals 5. It occurs there. So if you try to think of a business application, which everybody understands, if I want to um, minimize cost, for example, what is it that I'm minimizing? I'm trying to make my, I'm trying to get the smallest cost value possible, right? But I would want to know, well, how many things do I need to produce in order to minimize cost? And that would be the, the x value, okay? So that's the difference, and it is important that you understand the difference. So whenever you're asked for a relative max or relative minimum, you are looking vertically, okay, to get the value. Um, a horizontal line? That's a good question. I would say no, because <laughs> it doesn't do anything but remain constant. So we're never decreasing to it or increasing yeah. to it. All right, now we're going to use your calculators on this one. Yay. You're going to start using your calculators more. So make sure you always bring them. I think I forgot to remind you. But if you, um, if you forgot yours, then you can write down the steps that we're going through to do this. Okay. I'm going to give everybody a second to get those out. And by the way, I did write instructions out for you. Let me just show you where that is. So we're about to do this by demonstration, but um, yeah. I'm probably making people at home dizzy, but I just want to show you. So I did put the instructions there, okay? So you don't necessarily need to write everything down. All right. So let's get started. We're going to find the relative extrema. And then once we do that, we're going to let the calculator do this for us. In calculus, you have ways of finding these things by hand. But in algebra, you really don't. You just have to look at a graph. And so that's why we're learning to use the graphing calculator to find these max and min. So we're going to go to y equals, and we're going to type in the function. And that function was x cubed, so we do the x, the x key right here, power 3, plus 5x power 2, minus 8x. And you do have to use the subtraction, not the negative. Okay, so make sure you're using subtraction. And that's 8x. And then it's minus 12. So we wait and make sure everyone's got that far. Everybody there? All right, now let's all hit zoom 6. Let's see if we can see the graph. Oh gosh, it went way up, came down. Did y'all see that? Everybody see it? So it went way up, it came down, and then it went back up again. All right. Does everybody see a graph at least? Do I have anybody that didn't? I'm going to show you something that can mess your graph up just in case it happens to you accidentally. All right. Let me make sure this is. All right. Um, if I go back to y equals, if you ever have a graph that's not coming up, go back to your y equals and see if you've got the, a plot highlighted, because if you do, it can mess up your graph. That has to do with statistics, and we don't want to ever use it in this class. And so it's real easy to get it off. You just go up, hit enter, and then go off of it, and it shouldn't be highlighted anymore. All right, so usually I've got somebody sitting here that that happened to, but this today we were lucky, okay, so I had to make it up. All right, so let's go back to the graph. Now, one thing you can do is you can look in your table and try to guess where that thing is getting to a maximum and, and guess where it was going to a minimum to adjust what's called your window. The way you can see that is if you go into the second graph and you look at your table, 
then you can kind of get an idea of how high it's going. And the reason you want that is because we can't see it, and so my calculator is not going to be able to find the max and the min for me unless we can see the max and the min in the window. So the way to play around with it is to look in here and just kind of see, okay, let me go back and make sure everybody understood what I meant. We, we, when we saw it come in, we saw it go up and then come down and then go up again. It always comes in from the left. So we know somewhere in here it went to a maximum. And right now, let me show you where you are. If you go to window, I had us do zoom six. Zoom six, put, always put your window in this, with these same parameters. The, the smallest x is negative 10, the largest x is positive 10, and the scale on the tick marks is one. And then the same thing for y. So when you're looking at your graph, that's at 10, that's at negative 10. This is at negative 10, that's a positive 10. And so that's why I can say, okay, it was somewhere maybe around, let's go in the negative direction, 1, 2, 3, 4, maybe between negative 4 and <coughs> negative 3, we got a maximum. And so if I go to the table, that can kind of help me guess what I might want to go up to, okay? So I've already played around with it myself, so I'm going to give you guys a suggested window. So we're going to go back to window, and we're going to change it. And I'm going to leave the x's alone, because we saw that we came to a maximum, and then we went to a minimum on the window I already have. So I don't need to change x. It didn't happen over here somewhere, OK? And if your polynomial is a cubic, the most it can change direction is um, four times. Wait, is that right? One, two, three. Three times, I'm sorry. Three times. Okay, so, you, so the most you could have is one max, one min on a cubic. All right, so we're not going to change the x, but we are going to change the y. And remember, I did this by playing around with it myself. So you just have to get in there and, and kind of see what it did and, and make decisions on how you want to change your window. So I'm going to put in negative 20 for the minimum on y. And I'm going to go to 40 on the y max. And I actually, in the notes, I changed it to 2. I'm not even sure that's necessary. A lot of times it's not. But let's go ahead. We'll, we'll go ahead and change the scale since I did it that way in the notes. So I'll put it on a 2. So this just actually shrinks. Yes, that's right. And you can also use zoom in and zoom out. Mm -hmm. Those will help as well. I'll, I'll look at them. i got a funny look over there. I will show you what I mean in a minute. Okay. I kind of want to focus on max and min right now, so we can talk about that later. See how now I can see what's going on with this graph? That's what you need. So let me stop. What I did was I couldn't see the max and I couldn't see the min, so I had to change the window. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Now, how did I at home when I was doing this the first time figure it out? I didn't use calculus. I could have, but I tried to do it like you would have to do it. Okay, so I looked at where, you know, in between the X's, and I went to that table and said, okay, it looks like it's, you know, topping out somewhere in the high 30s or something. And so I just went ahead and went to 40. And then I did the same thing for in here. I could tell there was a minimum, so I looked in the table and just sort of guessed what I want to put for the minimum for, uh, for Y in the window. Okay. You guys okay right now? All right. All right, now I'm going to show you how the calculator finds the maximum and the min minimum for you. It all has to do with the fact that, okay, what would you say is happening there? Max or min? That's a max. Okay, on the left, what is the function doing? Increasing. On the right, okay, that's how it gets a max, right? That's the way the algorithm in the calculator works. From left to right, for a maximum, it needs to be increasing then decreasing. Okay, everybody ready? You're going to go to second trace. Okay? And we're, I want to look at the maximum first, so I'm choosing that. 
So we're going to choose four. Now notice when I hit the trace button, if there is a vertical intercept, that's the first time you hit trace with this graph, that's where it's going to be blinking is at that vertical intercept. Now is that, it's asking me for a left bound. Is that blinking to the left of this point? It is not. So I have to get over here to the left. You use your left right keys to do that. So I'm going to go left, left, left until I get over there. And it really doesn't matter how close. We're all going to maybe get answers that look slightly different. Let's see what happens. When it says left bound is the max, the point where it is has to, that is blinking has to be to the left. Yes. The max. Yes. And some students have a calculator which is actually showing them that. Like it's got a line. Does anybody have one of those? It'll have a line that's going down to the back. Those are kind of nice because it makes it real easy <laughs> to see where the left and the right are. My daughter still has, I shouldn't tell stories on my daughter, but she, she has to hold up her hand. Okay, that's L is left. Okay, so we're on the left, correct? Okay, so we're going to hit enter. Now it is asking me for a right bound. So I need to get over on this piece, anywhere on this piece, that it, where it, the function is decreasing. It really does not matter where, as long as you're not way over here. Why is over here not good? It's it, Well, yes, it's past the minimum and it is increasing. It's got to be on a piece where it's decreasing if you're looking for a maximum. Okay, hit enter. And when it says guess, you do not have to do anything except press enter. <coughs> and by magic, there you go. <laughs> now, do some people's calculators actually say negative four? Okay, that all had to do with where you were with your left and your right because the calculator has an internal algorithm that is doing this. And so for me, I was a little bit off, okay? So don't write a bunch of nines. You can count on if there's a bunch of nines, you can round that. If there's a bunch of zeros, you can round that, all right? So what I want to do is if you will write down what that point is, it's telling you what the point is. It's negative 4, and the maximum is 36. But well, wouldn't we have just figured that out with the table? No, because what if it happened, at, in fact, I showed you an example where I had written the points. It doesn't necessarily have to be integers. It doesn't have to necessarily occur at an integer either. Yeah. And so if my table is just integers for the x values, then I'm going to kind of miss it. Okay. And I don't want anybody guessing. You have a calculator. You're supposed to have a calculator. So Find it. Be accurate. Okay? All right, so everybody write down that point, and then we'll find the minimum, okay? You ready? Okay, it's going to be the opposite, right? Second trace. We're going to choose three because we want the minimum. And it's asking me for a left bound. Now, the minimum is here. So I need to be on the piece that is coming down to it, right? Not way over here. So I do need to move a little bit. Okay, so I'm at a good place now because I'm on a piece to the left of the point, but it is a piece where it's decreasing. Okay? So we're going to hit enter. And then it's going to ask for a right bound. So you're going to go, you want to you learn a shortcut yet? With not having to tap? Does anybody know? You don't want to learn a shortcut? Okay. I mean, I mean, not ready? <laughs> you can tap, tap, tap till you get over there. Sometimes that takes a while depending on how st steep the curve is. But that's one, two, three. Remember my scale for X was by ones. Okay, so this is one, two, three. If I just type that in, it'll go to the right. Okay, so you can get there faster. Okay, you're still tapping. Okay, that's fine. And now we got to guess. So here, Bernard, here's here's why you can't look in your table. All right, because if I need you to tell me where the minimum happens, it's you're not going to find that in the table. 
Does anybody recognize what fraction that is? Two thirds. Two thirds. And I'm going to show y'all um, how to get that because on your online program, if it says that you have to have a fraction or an integer, guess what? You have to have a fraction or an integer. It, it's it, some of them will let you round, okay, but some of them won't. So you can change that easily to a fraction if you need to. You can put in a whole bunch of point. You can go point six 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 six, etc., and then you hit your math key, and it'll change it for you. Math enter enter. Okay, we'll we'll look at that later if we have time. Yes, it depends on how we want to round. So I think I rounded to I rounded to one decimal, which makes sense when we're graphing by hand. Okay, so everybody write that down. Write down 0.7. That's positive 0.7 for x rounded, and then negative 14.8 because now we're going to transfer that to a little graph and answer the questions. Now, does anybody have a question about the use of the calculator? You're just going to have to practice. Okay. All right. You can have fun with it at home. Okay. All right. So let's do kind of a rough sketch, and then we will answer the questions. So we had negative 4. 36 was that relative maximum. And then we had uh, points, positive 0.7 and negative 14.8. I'm just going to remember I just want a rough sketch so that I can answer these questions. Tell what the domain and range of this function is. Two. Uh huh. And remember, this keeps going down. Same thing, right? So domain and range are, are all reals. All right. So, but let's answer the question. It says determine the intervals, if any, over which g is increasing, decreasing, and constant. Okay, so let's come in from the left. It is increasing first. So it is increasing on negative infinity until we get where? Negative 4. Remember, when you're answering the increasing, decreasing questions, it's the intervals of x. It's decreasing from negative 4 to... 0.7, but we are going to talk about how to deal with that if they make you do a fraction. Okay, we'll come back to that. And then it's increasing again forever after that. So we're going to put union 0.7 to infinity. So all of this is x values that are making y increase or decrease. Let's answer the next question. Give any relative maxima or minima. That's just plural. When they put the A on the end, that's just plural for that. So the relative uh, maximum is what? 36. It's a Y value. That's what we mean. It's a highest value. Highest is vertical, not the X. It's got to be the Y. And then a relative minimum of 0 0.7 if we're rounding to one decimal. All right, talk to me, guys. How does how do you think? Do you think you can get home and do this homework? Uh, no, that, not for a po that's a polynomial function. Polynomial functions will never be constant. Except for horizontal functions. So if in the homework it asks for constant, will there be any? 
Yes, yes, good question. Yes, you put D and E. That's correct. All right, let me show you how to deal with a fraction. If you, if you didn't recognize it, because I will have a few students who will come across a problem like this. And so we can put in a bunch of... Wait, how do you do that? How do I do what? Figure it out. I always oh, know. second. See where it says quit? So second mode is how you get back over there. All right, let's see. Okay. Let's see if this worked. Yep. So if I put enough of them in there, it'll change it for me. I'm just say, I am just saying, if you don't recognize the, what fraction that is, and if the directions say enter your answer as a fraction or an integer, you can't round and get it right. I, I hate that I have to teach you stuff like that that just has to do with the calculator, but it's the way it is. Okay? It's just because it's an online program. Okay? All right. Now, this is the fun one. And I love, hint, hint, I love this problem. Okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> you're going to see it come up several times. Yeah. I finally gave up and started, and I still have people get it wrong on the test, okay? But I finally gave up and put parentheses in for the students because students will type this one in like this. Well, actually, let me, let me do it. If you don't use the parentheses, I want you to see what happens. Bless you. So do not copy me right now. Okay, I'm going to clear that out. And I'm not going to put the parentheses as I should. So I'm just doing the top, the 5x divided by x power 2 plus 2, and then I'm going to do zoom 6. Oh, that is the reciprocal function that you learned in unit 1. Why is it giving me the reciprocal function? Well, let's, let's see what we told the calculator to do there. Remember, I did not put the parentheses in, which means it is doing this. What is x over x squared? That is 1 over x is that reciprocal function that you were supposed to learn in unit 1, you know, the one that looks like that. What did you say? <laughs> You're supposed to learn that. Okay, it looks like that, right? And what does it do if we multiply by 5? It stretches. What does it do if we add 2? It shifts it up, okay? But it's taking a different function. That is not the same function. So you have to do those parentheses because we want 5x not divided by x squared and then add 2. We want it divided by whatever x squared plus 2 is because that's what's in the denominator. So... Make sure you put the parentheses because they will not be written in the homework. Okay? I write them when I give you a test because I hope. <laughs> no, I gave up not writing the parentheses oh. and thinking that students should uh, know that. Okay, so let's do it correctly this time. So we're going to do 5x divided by parentheses x squared plus 2, and I already hit, I already did zoom 6. You guys might need to do zoom 6, and then graph. Okay, very different function, and there's some things I want you to observe. Um, let me see what happens if I zoom in on this one. It might, yeah, you can kind of see what's going on a little bit better if I, if I zoom it in kind of see it a little bit better, but um, I did zoom to, and then you hit enter. <coughs> it doesn't round so much. Go back to zoom six, start from that. 
and let it do that, do its thing. Now do zoom in, because I bet you still were in the other window. Okay. Oh, and I hope we didn't mess you up. If it's still, if you see something working over here, don't touch the calculator. It will freeze. Okay. I don't know if I, if I made you have the hard way. Okay. Then you can reset it, but. Okay. All right. So, so let's look at what's happening here. Do you guys see the, do you see how it's stepping down? Can you see that? Okay. These Y values are very close to each other. Very, very, very close. It's impossible to draw them by hand, and it's not even possible in the calculator to, I mean, if we blew the whole thing up, maybe, you know, if we let every tick mark be .01 or something, <laughs> then we might sort of see things differently. But we can't. So you do have to see that you're, you have a minimum, a maximum, rather, somewhere in there because it's coming down after that. You can see by the steps. Would that be a constant, though? That no, it, and that's important. It is not a constant. That's why I like this graph, because you have to know a lot, all right? It is not a constant there. It is coming back down, and if you looked at values like, okay, Bernard, let's try this. Do trace, just trace. You can see what those points are. So, like, if I get up there, okay, to where we're, you're thinking it's constant, Let's look at the Y's because now, the, yeah, see, they're a little bit different. They're real close, but they're a little bit different. You see it now? Yeah. So it really isn't constant even though it looks like it because they're so close together. Is everybody absorbing that? Okay. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to find the minimum. We're going to find the maximum. We're going to draw them, and there's one other thing we need to talk about with this particular graph. Okay, so let's do second trace. I'm going to go ahead and do that maximum, so that's four. And remember, I need to be to the left of it, so I'm going to make sure I'm on the part that's increasing and hit enter. And then I'm going to tap, and I'll wait till I get that, to that step down just to make sure, because I don't know exactly where it is in there. So I went to the step down. I'm going to hit enter, and then when it says guess, we're going to get that. And we're going to round, let's round to one decimal place. So round that, write, it, write down that point, 1.4, 1.8 approximately. That's our maximum. You guys ready for the minimum? Y'all ready? All right, so let's do second trace. We're going to do choice three. And we need to get over here to the left. This is where my shortcut might help because, <laughs> see, it takes a while to get over there. This is kind of bad because I can't even see the graph, but I think I'm over to the left now. So I'm going to hit enter, and then I want to go over to the piece where it's, I can see that it's going up with a right bound, okay, hit enter, and then hit enter again. Oh, isn't that interesting? What did you notice? The same thing as the what kind of symmetry is that? Symmetry of origin. Yes, it's symmetry to the origin. Remember the maximum, okay, was these two things, but they're opposites. So jot that one down, negative 1.4 and negative 1.8. And now let's sketch a picture, and we've got to talk about a couple other features of this particular graph. One question on that one. Yeah. So it doesn't matter where you pick that mark when you're going up or down, it's always going to come out to the same thing. That's yes, matter. that's right. That's right. As long as you understand to the left of a maximum, it should be increasing, and to the right, it should be decreasing, and vice versa for a minimum. Yeah, that's what's important as far as where you choose to be. Okay, so let's, oh, did it go through the origin? It does go through the origin. So zero is okay. I mean, plug it in and you can see five times zero over zero squared plus two is zero over two, which is zero. So it definitely, and you, if you went to the table, you'd see that point in there. It definitely goes through the origin. I'm going to plot that point. 
And then we're going to plot that uh, minimum approximately. So I'm make this, I'm going by 0.5s here. I'm going to do the same thing on the y-axis. All right, and so I'm going to plot 1.4, so that'd be about right there, and 1.8. Let's label that and get in the habit of labeling your points. Okay, now I haven't explained this yet. I will in a minute, but the x-axis is actually an, a horizontal asymptote, so draw it like that. We'll talk about why in just a minute. And now let's draw the minimum. That was at uh, negative 1.4, so about right there, and then negative 1.8, so approximately here. And it's an asymptote on the other side as well. So that's what the graph looks like. So let's answer the question first and then we'll talk about the asymptote. And we'll also talk about the range because I want you, you guys to recognize what the range What's the domain? Everybody should be able to just look at that and tell me the domain. Yeah, everything, right? We'll talk about the range in a minute. All right, so as you're coming in from the left, it's actually decreasing until you get here. So we're going to say it's decreasing on negative infinity until we get to that x value. And read your directions carefully, round however they say to. I'm rounding to one decimal because we're graphing it, so it doesn't make sense to, graph, to round any um, more than that. I mean like more decimals. It increases from here to here, so that's x values starting at negative 1.4 and ending at positive 1.4 approximately. And then it decreases again forever after that. Is everybody okay with that information? All right. And then it's never constant, so you would fill in if they have that answer blank, you do DNE. But we have a relative maximum, which is approximately, that's this one, right? So 1.8. We have a relative minimum, which is approximately negative 1.8. And so you guys tell me what the range is. Remember, range is highest to lowest, and you, you're going to have to approximate. What's the lowest value on this graph? Yeah, negative 1.8. I'm going to go ahead and put a bracket, even though that's not exactly accurate, but the way we're rounding, we're going to say that it's starting at negative 1.8. And then what's the top? 1.8. Yeah. Okay, so your little extra thing today, do we have an absolute maximum? Is there a, an actual highest value? Yes. Yeah. That's where we're getting range from, okay? And there is an, ac an absolute minimum on this one. They're the same as the relative maximum. Okay, now let me talk about the asymptotes, because right, or asymptote, rather. The x-axis for these graphs that you're going to see, where you've got a linear, make sure everybody sees what I mean by linear, you have a linear numerator, and you'll have a quadratic denominator, all right? They all look like this. They all have the x-axis as, as a horizontal asymptote. So what, is, what does it mean to have a horizontal asymptote? Okay, you don't need to memorize this. It's just conceptual now, right now. So just kind of see if you understand the concept of what I'm showing you. As we go further and further out, What's happening to y is it's just getting closer to zero. 
Now, I'm going to show you that in my calculator, but I'd like you to think about it for a minute. If x is getting bigger, 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 okay, but it's positive as you go out, right, then this is always, that's a square. What's going to happen with the, the, compare the top to the bottom. If you're squaring the bottom, you're squaring this x, whatever that x is, this is huge in comparison to the other number, right? Because you're squaring it. Like, think about squaring a million. That's a huge number. So you've got a million over an absolutely huge number. That's really, really, really close to zero without being zero. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so that's what's happening as we as we're going in the positive direction, we're getting ever closer to zero, but we will never hit it. We'll never equal zero. Why? Because that's where you equal zero is way back here. So you're not going to equal zero again out there. And something similar is happening in the negative direction. You can just trust me on that one. Okay. If, if you at least understand what I just said, then you're doing really well. Okay. And so just to show you real quick, what I can do that you cannot do with your calculator, but this is one of the nice things on the program that they have here. I'm going to let you guys just look at the Y as I let the X get big. So what I do is I just hold it down, okay, and so now my X's are getting big. Everybody see that? The X's are going towards infinity. Look at what's happening to Y. You see? It's getting smaller, smaller, smaller. Okay, but it's always going to be positive. You can't equal zero. And so that's why that's an asymptote. Okay? All right. Isn't this fun? <laughs> Eventually, we'll turn it off. It'll seem, it almost seems like that because they're so close together. And, and mathematically speaking, I'm sure that there is a, a way to say that, what you, just, what you just mentioned. It's not technically the same, though. That it, the further I, I mean, I'm getting new values. It's just that the, the difference is so small, you know, who can talk about them? You know, maybe they do. Oh, I was going to make a bad joke. Never mind. <laughs> Make you do that somewhere bad. Okay. All right. So let's do another problem. And this one's going to come up a lot as well. It's going to come up again when we're studying quadratics and parabolas because that's what it is. But it has to, oh, this is very apropos right now with the flu going around and everything. This is a function which gives a person's uh, temperature, body temperature, T hours, I think. Yeah, T hours, little t, hours after the onset of the illness. What ha Look at the function for a minute. So capital T is the person's temperature. Lowercase t is how many hours it's been since the illness began. Okay? Look at that function and tell me about t equals z lowercase t equals zero. What would you get? You plug in zero for lowercase t, what do you get? No, you don't get zero. You get 98.4. Does that make sense? That's a regular body temperature. Yeah, that's a regular body temperature. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to type this into our calculators, and we're going to find out what the maximum temperature is. It is a quadratic, and everybody in here has had quadratics at some point, or you, know, you wouldn't be sitting here because you had to do it in 1033. Notice that the square term has a negative. So these are actually parabolas that open downward. Now that makes sense because it's like, kind of makes sense. I know that the way things really work is a person's temperature might spike a couple of times, right? But they're, they're simplifying this situation where a person's temperature goes up, 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 it spikes, and then it starts to come back down again to normal is what they're talking about. All right. so. What we're going to do is we're going to find that person's maximum temperature using the calculator. So let's go back to the calculator. And we're 
we're going to go to y equals. Now we do have to use the negative this time. So negative 0.023. Don't change your variable. I'm, every now and then I'll have a student who figures out how to do that. Just use x. Power 2 plus, you don't need the 0. You can just go 0.5. Four, two, eight, hit the variable, plus 98.4. And then we're going to hit zoom six, but we're not going to see anything. So go ahead and hit zoom six. But let it work. Okay, mine's done. So nobody can see anything, right? All right, I'm going to show you something that sometimes helps. It is called zoom fit. It does not always work though. So I want to make sure you understand before I show you how to use zoom fit, how zoom fit works. Okay, zoom fit is going to work if the X's that you have in the window have the maximum or if it was a minimum, if they have it in between them. So in other words, if it's between 0 and 10, then if the maximum occurs between 0 and 10, then zoom fit's going to help me. Okay? Now if it's not, it's not going to help me. Can you broaden it? Yes, we're, we're going to talk about how to do that. And there's, there, are, there is more than one way, but before I even do that, though, I want you all to look at the problem again and see if something makes sense to you in terms of the t value, lowercase t values, which is what my x is. Look back at the problem. The illness lasts how long? 24 hours. 24 hours. So is it likely that that maximum is in the first 10 according to the function? Not really. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just, you guys don't hit, don't even hit zoom fit yet. Don't bother. I'm just going to show you what happens. If I hit zoom fit right now, which is zoom zero, I can see that the maximum's happening over here somewhere. So I can see that I need to change my X window. My X is in the window. So we're going to go back. Everybody go to um, the window. And I'm going to start at zero because this illness starts with time zero. And let's go to, say, 26. Whoops, I just did the wrong thing. I want to do, let's go back. Well, heck, I'll have to go to 30 now. Wait a minute, maybe that's what's wrong. Okay, zero, and I'm going to go to 24, or 20, 26, just to go outside the parameter. Now, you can't see this yet if you haven't graphed it, but I'm not quite getting the maximum. So remember, I can change my maximum here as well. So I'm going to go up, you know, I'm thinking about fevers and going, well, you know, people are dead past a certain fever, right? So let's put in a 105 maybe or 106. I'll put a 105. Now, when you hit graph, let's see if you can see your graph. <coughs> let's see what happens when you guys do that. Can you see it? Can everybody see it okay? So you probably didn't even need zoom fit. Okay, so I changed the, the parameters for x. I also changed so I could see the maximum. Now I can find it. Is everybody there? Okay. So second trace. We want the maximum. That's 4. I need to get to the left. I'm going to go to the step down, although with a parabola, you know, it, you know it's exactly halfway in there because it's a parabola. Enter. I need to go to the right. I'm going to go till it steps down just so we're in the habit of that. I went too far. And then hit Enter again. And then round according to what the problem says. This one says to round to one decimal. By the way, that's the vertex of this parabola. Okay? 
So if we round, it's 11.8 and 101.6 is the vertex. So we're going to jot that down. I'll just use this picture. So it was 11.8 and 101.6. Am I using a word you guys are unfamiliar with? Vertex? Okay. All right, so we, we've done that. Let's, let's answer the questions now. So this is where you've got to use your brain. There isn't one. If it's a parabola, it's either got a max or a min. Okay, when, when does the patient's temperature reach a maximum? When? What's the answer? 11.8 hours. Right? That's when. Because that's the time and this is the temperature. What is the patient's maximum temperature? Okay, so just read the questions carefully and you get it right. They might, those might be in the opposite order. Now, when we get into um, quadratics next week, we're going to eventually we're going to get to a vertex formula, and so you don't necessarily on a quadratic have to use your calculator. You'll be able to use the vertex formula instead if you'd rather do it that way. Okay, let's do this box problem and we'll be done. Okay, so this is a very simple engineering problem here. So let me share what they're talking about. What they're talking about is you have a sheet of cardboard, okay? And we're going to make a box out of it. It's going to be a box that doesn't have a top. Now, I didn't bring scissors with me, but what I'm going to do, I think you guys will get the point, is that what, what they do is they would cut a corner from each corner of this it's a square in this case, I think. We'll read that in a minute. I think, yeah, it's a square, right? 24 by 24. So mine's not. It's, mine is a rectangle, but it's not a square. But this is the point. Okay, so you end up with this figure where you're going to fold up the sides, right? Everybody understand what, what we're going to do? We're going to make a box out of this by folding up the sides. Okay, so if it started out 24 by 24, it's not that anymore, right? Okay, so let's think about what the dimensions are, and then we'll answer the question. So we don't know what the corner is going to be yet, but we know that we started with a piece that was 24 long and 24 wide. That's what we started with. All right. Now, we're cutting off X here and here. So let's write down what the dimensions of the base would be. So let me make sure everybody understands 3D, what we're talking about. So we've folded up these sides, right? And now we have this base of the box. So let's write down what the dimensions of the base of the box are. If it started at 24 and you've cut off X on both sides, what is it now? Yeah, 24 minus 2X, right? And this direction, since this was a square, is the same thing. Now, how high is this box? What's the height? Well, actually, it's just X, right? You know, because if you just fold it up, you're just folding up that piece, right? And so it's just X. So the length and the width are both 24 minus 2X, and the height is X. 
Now, what they are asking us to do, and you use a calculator to do this, is maximize the volume. Like, how big of a corner should we cut in order to maximize the volume? So, what we have to do is we have to come up with a formula. And do you guys remember that for a box? Length times width times height is what the volume of a box is. And so we're going to write that in terms of x. That makes it become a function of x. And so it's 24 minus 2x, 24 minus 2x, and the height is x. And so that's the function that we're going to type into the calculator. And that's all you have to do is use the calculator on this one. All right? So let me just do it real quick so we can finish up and I can give back Tess. So once you come up with your formula for I'm going to use a square, guys. Once you come up with your formula, because it was the same thing twice, right? So I'm doing 24 minus 2x that squared times x. And I'm going to go back to zoom 6, and hopefully we can see this thing. If we can't, we've got to change our window. And actually, this one, um, you have to go pretty, pretty high up. Let me see if the zoom fit helps me at all. Oh, it does help me a little bit. Okay. I can see the maximum is in there somewhere. And so I go to the second trace maximum. And I think this is going to work because I think we're seeing it. Whoops. Went too far. Enter, enter. And so it's at 4. 10, 24, and what's that? I hit it because I knew it was, I hit it real quick. I did it real fast because I'm trying to finish up. It was the vertical intercept, and I knew that already. Okay, so let's just make sure you understand the answer to the question, though. Okay, so what we just found was we got a maximum for this, but what was x? X was that size of that corner that was cut. And it said, what is the maximum possible volume? And so for that answer, you're going to say 1024 cubic inches, which you write with a cube on the inch. Okay?